Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody back again this afternoon. <clears throat> For those of you on television, we're still fighting a little voice problem, but uh, hopefully we can overcome it as we go along. Again, for all of you here in the studio, we uh, appreciate your coming in. And uh, we're going to turn right now to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. <clears throat> this is the but now that we're going to look at for the next few moments. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But like we've been doing all the way along, we want to go by what goes before, why the flip side. So let's jump up to verse 19. Verse 19. Now, as our program has been unfolding, I trust you realize <clears throat> that we dealt with Jesus and the Twelve, and then we dealt through the early parts of Acts with Peter, and then in our last program we were up to Paul <clears throat> addressing the Jews in uh, Galatia. But now we're going to come to Paul's doctrinal epistles. And uh, when I say doctrinal, that's why I always say that the book of Acts is not doctrinal so much as historical, but this book of Romans now is in the doctrinal area of Paul's writings. All right, verse 19 of Romans 3. Now we know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, <clears throat> we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Now I trust everybody that's heard me teach very long knows there was only one group of people who were under the law. And who was it? Israel, the Jew. And a good indication of that, turn with me, honey, to uh, Luke 17. Luke 17, which of course is still back in Christ's earthly ministry. Luke 17, and let's see, that's in verse 13 and 14. <clears throat> Luke 17, 13 and 14. Now this is during his earthly ministry. And as I have stressed over and over and over, everything Jesus said and taught and did was under the law. Never. Never did Jesus ever tell anybody, you're not under the law. And here's a good example. Luke 17, a group of lepers have confronted him. And so verse 13, these lepers lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves to the Priests. What priests? Well, down there at the temple. The priests of the law. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. <clears throat> uh, come back with me to Matthew 19. Because this seems to be a concept that is so hard for most of Christians to accept. That Jesus ministered under the law. And as soon as we get to the Apostle Paul, that's the first thing we hear. You're not under the law. You're under grace. And until you understand that separating of these two formats, you're in trouble. All right, Matthew 19, the rich young ruler, verse 16. <clears throat> Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he, Jesus, said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, that is eternal life, keep what? The commandments. What are the commandments? Law. See? Everything was according to the law. All right? Now let's come quickly back to Romans chapter 3. Verse 19 again. So Paul agrees with that. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, 
It saith to them who are under the law, Israel, the Jew. But the law is not only eternal, it's universal because it's between God and the whole human race. So the next portion of the verse gives that proof of it to every mouth, that every mouth might be stopped and all the world may become what? Guilty. I see, even in our enlightened age, <clears throat> how many in Christendom, all across your denominations, have got the notion that if you can just keep the commandments, live a good life, you'll make it. Terrible. Because, see, the law has no life in it whatsoever. It's a ministration of death. But we can't get that out of people's head because under Israel's time of God dealing, yes, the law was the instrument of faith and for them to keep it. But now that the law has been crucified, it's no longer the case. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But for now, Israel, under the law, as well as all the rest of the human race, are guilty by virtue of what the law says. And now verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds or the keeping of the law, the keeping of the commandments, there shall no flesh be justified, not even in Israel. Nobody, nobody can become justified by keeping the commandments. Why? And here it comes. For the law is the knowledge of sin, not life, sin, not righteousness, sin. All right, skip across the pages, or I guess a little more than that. Chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, because we've got to, again, get the reason that Paul comes down here in verse 21 with a but now. Because here in Romans chapter 7, he's going to say much the same as he said up here earlier in chapter 3. Romans 7, verse 4, 5, and 6. Romans 7, 4, 5, and 6. All got it? Wherefore, my brethren, you also are dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married or brought into a union with another, even to him who is raised from the dead, there's your resurrection power again, that we as believers should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, when we were in our unsaved state, the motions or the acts of sins which were by the law, in other words, all the things that the law identified were acts of sins, adultery, coveting, gossiping, uh, profanity, idolatry, all those things that the law forbid were things that the average individual did as they came naturally. All right? <clears throat> so when we were in the flesh, the acts of sins, which are by the law, did work in our members, that is, in our flesh, in this body of flesh, to bring forth fruit unto death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. Now verse 6. But now, see, there's another one. I'll probably skip over this one since we're using it now. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter or the law. All right, now before we establish anything else, let's see why we are dead to the law and the law is dead to us, Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 2. And I think I used this Saturday in our all-day seminar and I made the statement, I love this verse. I love it because it says it all. Colossians, chapter 2, verse 14. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, 
verse 14. Oh, got it. Uh, you got to see it with your own eyes. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Why were they against us? Because whenever you did something naturally, you broke the law. It's just natural. Now, see, now I don't like to get into politics, but once in a while it's appropriate. Way back in the beginning of our republic, it was understood that a democracy cannot function without biblical morality. Now, that's not Republican or Democrat. I'm not getting on political that way. But the, the picture of, of an operating democracy is it has to have a moral basis. Now, just think about that for a minute. Because if there is no morality, then democracy is just going to implode. And, of course, I think we're seeing it happen. All right. So the same way with the law of Moses and all the attendant rules and regulations, they worked against human morality, which was down, down, down. The old song, I've referred to it over and over over the program over the year, doing what comes naturally. And when we do what comes naturally, it's not God's direction, it's Satan's. All right, so when the law comes in and specifically said, thou shalt not, you see what it did to the human race or to the nation of Israel? It was against them. They were constantly buffered into it. All right, so read it again. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, that is the law and all of its ramifications. And our Lord took it out of the way. And what did he do with it? Nailed it to the cross. Now, what a beautiful picture. Just picture those commandments nailed to his cross. Why? They're dead. They have no more power over us. They have no more power over the believer because we're dead to it and it's dead to us. Now, for the unbelieving world, yes, the law still condemns. Don't get me wrong. The law is still condemning lost people every day of their life because they're doing opposite of what the law says. But as an instrument of salvation, no, it has no redeeming value whatsoever. All right, now then, from uh, Romans chapter 7, where we just were, I always like to use 2 Corinthians chapter 3 before we go back. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we've used these before. I know that we repeat. In fact, I had a letter again yesterday. Less, repeat, repeat, repeat. Well, the Scripture does. The Scripture will sometimes repeat two, three things in two verses. Why? It's the only way you get it. So bear with me. Bear with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians 3, starting at verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. In other words, there is no good thing in us, Paul says. I can do nothing outside of the power of Christ. All right, so I can't think of anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now verse 6, who, speaking of God, has made us able ministers of the New Testament, or this new agreement between God and man, not of the letter, now remember how he used it in Romans 7? It's another word for the law. So it's not of the law, but of the Spirit. In other words, as we've already seen in the last program, when the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead, that same power raised us out of deadness to sin and Satan's slave market and then indwells us to empower us in our daily life. Otherwise, we could never live it. We couldn't possibly live the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit. So that supersedes the law, because the law has been crucified. It's dead. All right. Now, if you think I'm kidding you, I think we use this maybe in the last program, or the last taping. For the letter killeth, it doesn't give life, it gives death, the Spirit giveth life. Now look at verse 7. 
But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, now just think a minute. What in all of human history, there's only one thing I know of that was given to mankind written in stone. And what was it? Ten Commandments. So that's what he's talking about. Their ministration of death. They can't give life. Because when the law was laid down, and as soon as it's broken, it's sin. And sin alienates. And sin is synonymous with death. See how it all fits? All right. So the letter, the letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, was glorious in Israel's history, of course it was so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. In other words, when he came down from the mountain. But how shall not the ministration of the Spirit now then be rather or more glory? So if the law could make the face of Moses shine, then the Spirit should be able to illuminate even you and I as believers. All right, come back again to Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Reading again verse 20, because, oh, you can't read this often enough. Over and over, because we are in, even all of Christendom is just inundated with this idea that you can keep the commandments and live a good life and God will let you in. Never happen, because that's not the purpose of the law today. The purpose of the law is to condemn, all right? Verse 20, therefore... <clears throat> by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Nobody. Why? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Not life. Sin. And I've already said it. Sin and death are synonymous. So that's all the law can do. Now we come down to our verse 21. But now. What's the flip side of all this? That yes, that's the way it was. The law was for Israel. The law was that part that brought them into a relationship with Jehovah God. But that was nailed to the cross. And now on this side of the cross, how many times have you heard me say that? On this side of the cross, it's a whole new ball game. It's a whole new leaf. Because the cross made the difference. All right? How? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. It's spotlighted. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, goodness, what does that mean? Well, again, the big picture. You go all the way back to the giving of the law. Does it ever drop out of sight for those 1,500 years? No. The law was part and parcel of Israel's life. But the prophets writing under the law, they too were in complete agreement with everything that the Mosaic law was teaching Israel to prepare them for the coming of their Messiah. That's why the law was given, to prepare them morally, spiritually, for this great prophetic day that was coming, the appearance of their Messiah. But unfortunately, it didn't do what God intended it to do, and Israel still was ignorant and blind of who he was. But nevertheless, that's all this verse means, that this, this doctrine of grace and salvation by faith alone does not just come out of the woodwork. It comes as an unfolding of all that went before. And as we study the law and the prophets, Christ's earthly ministry, and the rejection of it, and now I always call it that fork in the road, they stoned Stephen. And that's when Israel said, we'll not have this man to rule over us. God takes off on this fork of the road. Israel goes down into the dispersion. The whole Jewish economy falls apart. And now we come to this glorious other part of God's program, Paul's gospel of 
grace. Of course, it all came before. All right? Now then, verse 22. <clears throat> Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith or through the faith of Jesus Christ, now, when Paul speaks of faith in Christ, he's not talking about just his messiahship or his deity. He's talking about his whole fulfilling the gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection. All right? So even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, here's one of these verses. It doesn't say plus nothing, but there's nothing there. And if you go back to your Elementary arithmetic, when you've got a one-digit number plus zero, what's the answer? Three plus zero is three. Five plus zero is five. All right, the gospel plus zero is the gospel. Now, I can't make it any plainer than that. I can't make it any plainer than that. All right, so it's upon all them that what? Believe. Plus nothing. It's believing. It's faith. For there is no difference now between Jew and Gentile. All right? Well, we can just keep on going in this series of verses. For all have sinned. Every human being stands in need of God's saving grace. And they've all come short of the glory of God. But now, after that, generalized conviction of the whole human race comes the great generalized promises that just as sure as the whole human race is under condemnation, the whole human race now has an opportunity for salvation. No one is left out. No one. Not the poorest of the poor. Not the Richest of the rich, no one is left out. Why? Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption or the process of buying us back that is in Christ Jesus. See? Verse 25, speaking of Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation Christ is everything that needs to be done. Now, I don't know whether theologians would agree with me or not, but it's the best way I can explain propitiation. You remember when Israel had the tabernacle out there in the wilderness? Out at the front gate was the brazen altar, the place of sacrifice of the animals and the shed blood. Then came the laver of cleansing, where they washed between the altar and the sanctuary. And then they go into the sanctuary, wherein were all the various furnishings, the lampstand, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the curtain, and then behind the curtain, the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat. Put all that together, and that's all a picture of Jesus Christ in his saving role. That's propitiation. He's everything. He's the altar. He's the sacrifice. He's the Laver of cleansing, he is the cleansing. He is the lampstand, he's the light. He's everything that made up the tabernacle. That's propitiation. All right, reading on. And we receive that propitiation through faith in his blood. We can never set the blood aside. And along with that, we declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance or the mercy and the grace of God. Now here it comes, verse 26, and this will finish this half hour. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, not Paul's, not Abraham's, not anybody else's, but Christ, God's righteousness, that he might be just. No corruption in that word. There's no bribery in that word. There's no cutting corners in that word. He is totally just and fair. And what does he do? He is the justifier 
of him who, here comes another one of my verses, that believeth plus nothing. See how plain all these verses are? Now if it took something beside believing, there are two places right here where it would have to be. Now you see most people still hang on Peter's message of Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Is it in here? Go back to verse 22. And of all them that believe and repent and are baptized. No, it doesn't say that to those that believe. Well, the same way in this verse here. Just read it if that's what people are trying to say. To declare, I say, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes and repents and is baptized. It doesn't say that. Again, I'll come back to my simple illustration. It's three plus nothing is three. That's all. And it's to that person who believes in Jesus. Now, we always have to remember that when Paul speaks of Jesus, he's speaking of, I think we got time. Flip over quickly, honey, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Whenever Paul uses the name Jesus or Jesus Christ, just because he doesn't delineate the death, burial, and resurrection doesn't mean that's not what he's thinking about. It is. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. You all with me? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. Well, we've already been covering it. What all was involved in the preaching of the cross? Who he was. He was the Son of God. He was God himself, the Creator. And what did he do? He died the death of the cross. His blood was shed. He was in the tomb three days and three nights. And then what? He arose from the dead in power and majesty and glory and ready now to impart that same eternal life to anyone who would simply believe it. And that's the preaching of the cross. And there is no other way. There is no other preaching that can bring person into a knowledge of salvation. Even though most of the world rejects it, we still have to believe it. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.